When I played my first Zelda game, Ocarina of Time, one of my favorite things about it was its world. People like to rag on how empty Hyrule Field is, even I've done it. But something that I will always praise Ocarina's Hyrule for is how it creates a convincing, interconnected world. The kind where I could reach the Lost Woods by taking a secret tunnel in Goron City. The kind where I could wash up in Lake Hylia by falling into the river in Gerudo Valley. Each region has its own designated entrances and exits, and traveling between each area is interrupted by a short transition, but they all still feel like smaller pieces of a larger whole. When I played The Wind Waker, the Great Sea was one of my favorite things about that game. I loved exploring it because it felt like anything could happen at any given time. I could run into a big Octorok that spit out a great fairy when I defeated it, or I could randomly find a ghost ship before even finding the map that reveals its location. Moments like these made for an unforgettable adventure. I loved the feeling of charting this vast ocean and not always knowing what awaited me. People who grew up with the very first Zelda game have their own stories about their time exploring Hyrule. Friends would share their findings with one another, and the open-ended nature of the game made it so that no two people had the exact same experience. But aside from Wind Waker, the series never really came close to capturing that magic again. When A Link to the Past introduced the now all-too-familiar formula that Ocarina of Time, considered by many to be the best entry in the series, used as well, that formula became the standard for Zelda going forward. Some installments would shake things up a bit every now and then, but the basic structure of entering dungeons, acquiring a new item, and using said item to unlock more of the world and reach the next dungeon remained unchanged for decades. This resulted in Zelda games that still had large worlds to explore, but they weren't exactly open. There was now a script, a predetermined sequence of events that limited how much of the world could be explored at a given time. When Skyward Sword came out and turned out to be the most linear entry to date, going as far as sectioning off each major region of its world, making it impossible to seamlessly travel from one area to another, that was the final straw for a lot of people, and Zelda's very identity started to be questioned. Many felt that the series had lost sight of what made it so special. Zelda began as a game that gave you little to no direction, hoping that your own curiosity would motivate you to explore. But now, it was a series that was too afraid of letting go of your hand, and too afraid afraid of letting you get lost. The formula was getting stale, and was gaining more detractors with each new Zelda game that was released. Something had to change, and the Zelda team knew it. Upon receiving all the feedback and criticism about Skyward Sword, they knew that one thing was certain. If they wanted to prevent the series from stagnating, they had to go back to the drawing board and start from square one. They had to rethink the conventions of Zelda. Doing so would mean inviting change, and not everyone is a fan of change. But sometimes, change is a necessary step for progress. A necessary step to craft a new beginning. And needless to say, it ended up paying off. The Legend of Zelda once again made waves that were felt by the entire industry. It did this by giving players true freedom and a world where they could test the limits of that freedom, only for them to find that there weren't many limits. It gave players an adventure where how long it was, how many quests needed to be completed, how many areas needed to be visited, was left up to them to decide. This was a game that was unequivocally non-linear and open. This was Breath of the Wild. It is a game that I've loved since I first played it over six years ago. No game had ever immersed me as much as this one with its world alone. And my first time exploring this iteration of Hyrule was an experience no other game has yet to match. But Breath of the Wild is also the Zelda game I probably have the most conflicted feelings towards. I consider it a masterpiece for what it managed to achieve, but it isn't without its faults, and it does have many of them. And I'm not trying to be a hater, all you weirdos already leaving negative comments and dislikes on this video because you disagree with someone else's opinion. Grow the f up by the way. I want to leave no stone unturned. I simply want to share my journey with this game, my anticipation for it, why I adore it in spite of its shortcomings and its departure from conventions I had grown to love, and what it has come to personally mean to me over the years, and what I feel it represents. So without further ado, this is it, the big one. This is The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild.
On January 23, 2013, a Nintendo Direct aired with a whole section dedicated to The Legend of Zelda. This is where the HD remake of Wind Waker was announced, alongside details about the brand new Zelda game being developed for the Wii U. This is where Aonuma confirmed that the main goal for the project was to rethink the series conventions. They wanted to challenge what had come to be expected from a new Zelda game, like having to complete dungeons in a certain order, or having to play by yourself. More information was to be shared at a later date, but the seeds had been planted for what would become a Zelda game unlike any other. And in November of that year, we got a small taste of what exactly rethinking the conventions of Zelda meant with the release of A Link Between Worlds, which is, fun fact, my favorite 2D Zelda game, and I even go back and forth on it being my favorite Zelda game, period. A Link Between Worlds experimented with an item rental system, where you have access to nearly every item in the game shortly after beating the first dungeon, and almost every area of Hyrule was fully explored just a few hours in. This made a game that was otherwise very derivative feel incredibly fresh and new, and people loved it. But this was only the beginning. At E3 2014, Zelda Wii U was shown for the very first time with a simple snap of a finger. This was the world's first look at Zelda Wii U, and Aonuma promised that the size of Hyrule this time around wasn't just for show. He claimed that you could reach any landmark shown here from any direction. There were no boundaries, no progression gates, nothing to stop you from going wherever you wanted to go. Not to mention that the world itself looked gorgeous. The grass and trees and the windmill reacted to the wind. The fog sweeping across the lush field gave the scene an incredible sense of atmosphere. I remember being absolutely mesmerized by what I was seeing. Then the demo ended with a chase scene involving Link and his horse being pursued by this giant sentry robot. Link leaps into the air to shoot an arrow into its eye, giving us the first look at his new design. Now donning a blue tunic, longer hair, and a more feminine face apparently, considering how many people were debating if this was a female version of Link, or some brand new character altogether, or maybe even Zelda herself. Then now Numa added fuel to the fire by later saying, nobody said that was Link. It ended up being Link, but this all just added to the excitement and discussion about the game. So much about this project was still unknown, to the point that it wasn't too far-fetched to think that Link not being the protagonist this time around could simply be another convention that was being broken, so it became a popular theory for a while there. The game was given a 2015 release window, which was reconfirmed at the Game Awards in December in a segment where Miyamoto and Aonuma showed off more of the game. This is where the paraglider was revealed. Link's ability to enter bullet time was quickly shown as well. And of course, who could forget? Real horses don't run into trees very often. But I think the part that floored everyone the most, including myself, was when Aonuma zoomed out the map and showed just how huge Hyrule was in this game. My jaw was on the floor when he did this. And to think that we just had to wait one more year to get our hands on it. All oh, right, this is 3D Zelda we're talking about. On March 27, 2015, Zelda Wii U received its first delay. The reason given was that while developing the game, the team came up with tons of new ideas for the project. The team was now focused on bringing as many of these ideas to life in order to create the most fully realized version of the game they could make. Of course, this was a tough pill to swallow for fans like me given how excited we were for the game, and this couldn't have been an easy decision for Nintendo either. The Wii U wasn't doing so hot, and it desperately needed that one killer app to ignite at least a bit of interest in the console. But instead of of rushing Zelda Wii U's production, they stayed committed to a healthier work ethic so that the final product wouldn't suffer from rushed development. The only other information about the game we got this year was shared in the November Direct, where after the Twilight Princess HD reveal, Reggie confirmed that Zelda Wii U was on track to release in 2016. But there was a small wrench in this plan that was becoming harder to ignore, the NX. Nintendo had announced the NX in early 2015, and with Wii U sales not seeing any improvement, all of the evidence suggested that the Wii U would experience a shorter lifespan than previous Nintendo systems and would be replaced by the NX. Basically, the new Zelda at the time was slated to release on a system that was on its way out the door, so Nintendo did what some folks had already been predicting for a while. Zelda Wii U got its second big delay in March 2016, now shooting for a 2017 release for both the Wii U and the Nintendo NX. Also shared were Nintendo's plans for E3 this year, where they announced that the new Zelda game would be their only game at the show. And this is when I started to worry. Accepting another delay was hard enough on its own. But remember that this was 2016. I was a Nintendo fan. This was our hell. Zelda Wii U and the NX were some of the only things left for us to look forward to, given the inconsistent quality of products Nintendo was pumping out during this time. And it was hard not to start to think that the game might be in trouble. Why was it taking so long for more news to be shared? When it comes out, is it even going to be good? This open world that they're boasting about, is it even going to be fun to explore it? Will there be things to 
to do? Will it keep me engaged? Or will it feel empty and lifeless? Maybe the team was way in over their heads working on a project as massive as this one for the first Zelda game to be made in high definition. There were so many things that could go wrong. But I mean, there wasn't much I could do except wait and have faith that the delays were a sign that the game was simply receiving the polish and care I wanted it to get. On June 14th, all would be revealed. Open your eyes. There's a certain trailer I'll get to later that's often lauded as one of the best video game trailers of all time. And it certainly is, but I believe that this one from E3 is, well, absolutely perfect at highlighting the game's main attraction. The first minute or so is just footage of the world itself. The vistas, the wildlife, the peaceful scenery. And when the music swells and Link jumps off of that cliff and glides, the focus remains fixed on the world. You can find and tame wild horses in this world. You can cook in this world. You can hunt in this world. You can find bosses in this world. You can burn this world. You can climb anything in this world. You can explore this world. The skeptic in me still felt a little unsure about how different this felt from other Zelda games. So much so that even the subtitle wasn't a reference to a character or item like the previous games' subtitles were. But something about this shot of the Master Sword gave me an oddly comforting sense of reassurance that this was still Zelda. The next step for Zelda. This was Breath of the Wild. Certainly a unique title compared to what we were used to, and it took a bit of time for it to really catch on. But nowadays, I couldn't think of a more fitting name. For the next couple of days, more information about Breath of the Wild was shared via the Treehouse live streams. The version being played on stream as well as what attendees were able to play was the Wii U version of the game, with the NX version being saved for a later date. The demo was confined to an isolated plateau, with it being impossible to leave without the glider seen in the trailer. Nevertheless, it served as a perfect playpen to showcase Breath of the Wild's plethora of new gameplay mechanics, giving us a proper look at what all that development time had accomplished. This wasn't just any cookie cutter open world. The range the range of interactivity and puzzle solving shown off here made Breath of the Wild seem like a different beast entirely. And even though the plateau was the only area shown off in great detail, we got snippets of what we could expect from the rest of the game and an idea of just how small the plateau was compared to the rest of Hyrule. While it seemed like they were revealing a lot about the game, little did we know just how much was still being kept under wraps. This all just made the wait for the game even more painful than it already was. People were desperate for new information. Even just just a crumb of gameplay would have sufficed. Well, when the NX was unveiled in October, revealed to be the Nintendo Switch, crumbs were certainly what we got. Just a couple of seconds of Breath of the Wild running on Nintendo's next generation system in both docked and handheld mode. But the handheld mode footage looked pretty rough. People took note of the choppy frame rate and voiced their concerns about Breath of the Wild's performance on the Switch, given the system's handheld nature. For all we knew though, the performance would be ironed out by launch, though when exactly Breath of the Wild would launch remained a mystery. The trailer ended with a projected release month of March 2017 for the Switch, but it was still unclear whether Breath of the Wild would launch on the same day or a couple of months later. In December, the Game Awards gave us even more Breath of the Wild gameplay in the form of a short trailer and a Treehouse Let's Play video, showing areas beyond the plateau, as well as NPCs. PCs, stables, towns, a tease at Zelda's new design, and a slew of other details. But still, there was no release date, and the treehouse demonstration, again, showed the game performing rather poorly in this dense forest area, this time on the Wii U version. Rocky frame rate aside, it was an exciting time, no doubt. Breath of the Wild was somehow attracting the attention of a more general audience. Both it and the Switch were, as a matter of fact. The two were a perfect match. They were both products from a more confident and bold Nintendo, a Nintendo that was willing to take risks to escape the hole they had been stuck in during the entire Wii U generation, a period where most of the public was unaware that the company even had a new console on the market. I mean, I had family members who, after all these years, were still calling my Wii U a Wii. So to see all this hype for a new Nintendo system from people who weren't even diehard Nintendo fans was a pretty surreal thing to witness. And now we've arrived at January 2017, where Nintendo held a presentation live from Tokyo all about the Nintendo Switch. As someone who had been closely following this company for years, this event was nothing but pure euphoria. Some parts about the presentation were questionable, like how the Switch would require a subscription to play online, but the hardware itself and the games that were revealed signified that Nintendo was entering a new, modern era. Splatoon 2. 
Whether that was a good or bad thing, I'll leave it up to you. The Switch was given a locked release date of March 3rd, 2017. But as the conference was coming to a close, one thing was still missing. And needless to say, they saved Breath of the Wild for last for a reason. Because the final trailer is what launched everyone's hype levels for the game into the f***ing stratosphere. This trailer just bombarded us with new information every second. It was a far cry compared to how reserved previous trailers and gameplay videos were. Now they weren't holding anything back. New areas, new gameplay, new enemies, new characters, an ass load of new story details, brief looks at the game's dungeons, and this music is so... just listen to it. It was perfect. Perfect. Everything. Down to the last minute details. And finally, after all this time, we got our look at this game's version of Zelda and... You ever wish you could erase your memory to experience something for the first time again? This trailer is something I wish I could experience for the first time again. It is incredible. Most worries I still had about Breath of the Wild were put at ease after I watched it. And the cherry on top? March 3rd, 2017. The planets had perfectly aligned. The most exciting Zelda game, no, the most exciting Nintendo game in years, was going to be the premier launch title for the most exciting Nintendo console in years, and it was only a couple of months away. The following month, Nintendo flexed their newfound confidence with their first ever Super Bowl commercial all about the Nintendo Switch, putting even more eyes on the system and on Breath of the Wild. The only sour spot from January to March that I can recall occurred on February 14th, where a video was uploaded to Nintendo's YouTube channel where Aonuma announced the Breath of the Wild Expansion Pass, a $20 DLC expansion for the base game. Purchasing it would unlock some in-game items that would be ready on release day, and more substantial content that would be released in the summer and winter of that year. Some people were pretty upset over this, as it made them worry that this was content that was being intentionally cut out from the game so that Nintendo could make a couple of extra bucks selling it separately. This whole controversy, if you even want to call it that, was blown out of proportion if you ask me. I think it was silly trying to use this as a way to claim that Breath of the Wild was somehow unfinished, though I do think the DLC would have been received more positively had it been announced a few months after the game's launch. It's not like the items available on the Great Plateau at launch were anything special. Never mind what I said, this is the best DLC of all time. To the surprise of nobody, Breath of the Wild received 10 out of 10s across the board and quickly became one of the highest rated games of all time, rivaling even Ocarina's accolades. Sounds familiar, right? A lot of Zelda games that preceded Breath of the Wild enjoyed similar levels of praise upon their release. But it was different this time. As time has shown, this was a Zelda game that was able to compete with Ocarina of Time in terms of impact and status. Leaving behind the series' tired conventions managed to not only appeal to longtime fans, it also attracted those who had never touched a Zelda game in their lives. Breath of the Wild hit the mainstream and went viral, so to say. Clips of players just messing around in the game's world were popping up everywhere. The game was exciting, it was new, it was refreshing. It raised the bar for open world video games and video games in general, and the good word of mouth made everyone want to try it out. Adding to the buzz was the fact that this massive adventure could be played in its entirety on a device the size of a small tablet. It could be experienced at home or on the go for a few hours at a time before needing to recharge the Switch's piss poor battery. I had friends who mainly played on Xbox or PlayStation not only asking me about the Switch, but about Breath of the Wild, and if I would recommend it to them because they saw the praise the game was getting online. Friends who were Nintendo fans but weren't familiar with Zelda would ask me if Breath of the Wild was a good starting point. A cousin of mine who lived in an entirely different state reached out to me to say that they bought a Switch just so that they could play Breath of the Wild after seeing me play the game when I visited that summer and after seeing a bunch of content and creators they followed playing it on YouTube. When has a Zelda game ever attained so much mass appeal that people were basing their entire YouTube channels on this one game? Let's plays, lore videos, challenge runs were everywhere. This is the type of thing that only happens with games like Minecraft, GTA, Pokemon, Call of Duty. You know, the heavy hitters, the games that sell millions of copies for breakfast even when they don't deserve it. Surely, Breath of the Wild hasn't sold anywhere near this much. Holy sh**. 
Talk about a phenomenon. In a little over a year, Breath of the Wild became the best-selling Zelda game of all time. And as of September 2023, the game has sold more than 31 million units. Not only that, it won Game of the Year at the Game Awards in 2017, a year that saw the release of games like Horizon Zero Dawn, Nier Automata, Persona 5, even Nintendo's own Super Mario Odyssey, and Breath of the Wild was widely regarded by most media outlets and gamers alike as 2017's best game. And yeah, I agreed. I got Breath of the Wild and the Switch the month they came out. It definitely would have been easier to get it on the Wii U considering the stock issues plaguing the Switch during this time, but I wasn't going to pass up on my parents' offer to buy me one for getting good grades in school. The problem was that I just needed to find one. It took a couple of weeks, but I managed to snag a Switch off of Amazon, the grey Joy-Con variant because I used to be a boring bitch, and a copy of Breath of the Wild. This was probably the most excited I had ever been for a game in my entire life before FF7 Remake came along. Everything I had seen throughout this grueling, agonizing three-year wait completely blew me away. And yet, it wasn't until I was able to play the game for myself that these reviews started to make a lot more sense. For all intents and purposes, Breath of the Wild was a miracle. Everything about this game felt impossible. And at its core, it was still a Zelda game. You could break pots, ride a horse across a grassy field, visit towns and complete side quests, find secrets and other hidden treasures, collect heart containers. This was a Zelda adventure through and through. Only this time, the adventure was truly my own to shape, and I was engrossed by almost every second of it. The sacrifices that were made in the transition to open world were noticeable, and I will talk about them. But for now, I want to stay positive, and right out the gate, the game leaves a strong first impression. Open your eyes. Wake up, Link. When booting Breath of the Wild up for the first time, there's no title screen, no file select screen. In no time at all, you gain control of Link after a voice tells him to wake up. You walk up to this terminal and receive the Sheikah Slate, a device that will help guide you. You enter the next room containing two chests that give you a worn shirt and pair of pants, which you can either choose to wear or ignore if you want to keep staring at Link's perfect skin for a little while longer. The terminal in this room opens a door leading outside, and after the voice tells you that you are the light that must shine upon Hyrule once again, you climb this ledge, walk outside, and are greeted with a panoramic view that, I think I can speak for all of us when I say, never get sold. The time you spent in that cave will be the most scripted bit of gameplay you'll encounter during your whole adventure. Because from here on out, freedom is the name of the game. You're pointed in the direction of an old man who has set up a campfire just down the hill. He'll fill you in on where you are, and will allude to the decayed state of the kingdom if you choose to talk to him. You can also steal his baked apple and torch to trigger some funny dialogue. But you don't have to do any of this. You can skip talking to the old man altogether and instead just collect tree branches, apples, bugs, find an axe, a rusty sword on a pedestal, explore a temple of time that's a little worse for wear, get into your first fight, and by now it may have dawned on you that nobody has told you what you need to do. And barring the quick item descriptions that pop up when you pick up a material or weapon, and the blips of text explaining a mechanic after you've initiated it for the first time, nobody is telling you how to do anything either. It's not until you hear the mysterious voice again while exploring the area that you're given an objective. Following the voice's instructions, Link finds another terminal to to activate, causing a tower to rise from beneath his feet and triggering a chain reaction where multiple towers all across Hyrule begin to rise as well. You can even see some of them from where you're standing, some that seem to be located miles away. Despite how large the distance between you and these towers appears though, it's safe to assume that you can reach them as well. And this was the moment when the true size of Hyrule really started to sink in for me. It was one thing seeing someone else zoom out on the map. It was another thing entirely to witness the size of this world for myself. 
After downloading a map of the Great Plateau on your tablet, the voice you've been hearing tells Link that he's been asleep for 100 years, and that the beast that can be seen floating around the castle, later revealed by the old man to be an entity of pure malice known as Calamity Ganon, will destroy the world once it gains its full power. Link appears to be suffering from some type of amnesia though, as the old man, who meets up with the hero once he climbs down the tower successfully, seems to imply that he should recognize the voice in his head. Nevertheless, even without his memories, Link's instincts tell him that he needs to make his way to the castle. With no no way of getting off of the plateau, however, the old man offers Link his paraglider, which will allow him to leave safely, in exchange for some treasure hidden in four shrines located throughout the plateau, and thus begins one of the best tutorials in any video game. The Great Plateau is designed to give you a small taste of what the rest of Breath of the Wild has in store for you. It's a condensed area with four objectives that you can knock out in any order. Before taking on the shrines, you may be inclined to gather some resources, because you'll quickly realize that Link is very frail at the start of the game, and enemies will not hesitate to gang up on him. The plateau is littered with Bokoblin camps you can raid for weapons, and nooks and crannies hiding chests with more valuable equipment. There's a forest with animals to hunt for meat, and as you explore the plateau, you can find the old man out and about. If you decide to talk to him, he'll give you some advice, like how to make better use of the raw ingredients you've collected by cooking them, as long as you use the right ingredients, otherwise you'll end up with something so disgusting it has to be censored. It should still satisfy Twitch's guidelines, right? He can also give you some survival tips for when your search for the shrines inevitably leads you to Mount Hylia an area that will sap your hearts away due to the freezing temperature. Either cook some spicy peppers to unlock a cold resistance effect, or if you read the old man's journal, you can gather the ingredients needed to cook a specific dish he likes, and he will reward you with a warm doublet that you can wear to brave the cold with no issue, or he'll just give it to you if you manage to make it to the top of this mountain. You can also just ignore all of this. You can learn everything the old man teaches you yourself through experimentation, and it's not like he'll teach you everything anyways. Breath of the Wild's robust physics system, for instance, is something you need to fiddle with yourself. The plateau provides several opportunities for you to play with the game's physics, from boulders placed above a group of enemies that you can use to squash them, chopping down this tree so that when it lands it creates a bridge, which I guarantee will be the only time in the game you do this, so maybe it isn't the best example to illustrate my point, but I think it's cool nonetheless, to this area where you can use a strong wind to your advantage by setting the the grass on fire to take out another group of enemies. Almost everything in Breath of the Wild is a puzzle, and in one of the prime ways that the game breaks tradition, every obstacle in this game has what feels like an infinite number of solutions, instead of just one clear-cut answer curated by the developers. And the Great Plateau is the perfect area to familiarize yourself with this kind of problem solving, because your limited selection of items, stamina, and ways of getting around forces you to think outside of the box. Why would you go through the trouble of setting a fire that will spread to an enemy camp rather than fighting the enemies head-on? Well, because weapons can break in this game, and especially in the cases of flimsy sticks and rusty swords, the most common type of weapon on the plateau, they break all the time, so you're encouraged to find a more efficient way of dealing with enemies. There's also the fact that combat carries a high risk this early on. These blue bokoblins can kill you in one hit. This stone talus that you can stumble upon in the forest will kill you in one hit. These guardians that activate when you get near them that shoot freaking lasers from their eyes, you guessed it, will kill you in one hit. But as I said, Almost everything in this game can be approached in more ways than one. Even the seemingly invincible guardians can be dealt with this early on, with a properly timed parry to deflect their lasers back at them. And this level of freedom also applies to, what I'd argue, is the biggest thing that separates Breath of the Wild from other open world games, how you explore the world. Because the trailers didn't lie. You can climb anything with only a small handful of exceptions. Your stamina is the only thing that limits how much of a particular structure you can climb, and it turns the act of climbing into a puzzle in and of itself. If you choose to climb this cliff to reach the stasis shrine for example, you'll learn how to use the rugged nature of the cliffside to find rest spots to recover stamina. The more things you climb, the more you'll notice that even the smallest of imperfections, the tiniest of slopes, can be exploited to get the most out of your stamina. So you come to think of the stamina wheel not as a fixed limit dictated how much you can climb, but rather something that represents the absolute minimum distance you can clear. With proper skill and ingenuity, you'll be amazed by how high you can go, and it's a skill you'll utilize all the way up to Hyrule Castle. To this day, I still think that climbing is the bravest mechanic they could have included, that shows the developers pride in how meticulously they crafted this world. The ability to climb anything delivers on the promise made when Breath of the Wild was first revealed. This is a world with no boundaries. Hyrule is constructed so organically and realistically that you can scale the mountains surrounding Zora's domain and see the Akala region on the other side. And it's so open that the developers don't have to worry about a mechanic like this breaking some intended sequence or leading the players to some out of bounds area. Because everything you can see, you can go to. Everything is explorable. 
and climbing is what makes that possible. I never thought a game would come along that would allow me to climb just any random wall without a rope or a ladder or vines or needing to wall jump or use a hook shot or any crap like that. It goes against how I've been conditioned to view these kinds of obstacles in other video games. It feels forbidden, it feels taboo, and now every new open world game I play that has a focus on exploration feels gross after getting used to Breath of the Wild's mobility. Sorry, Horizon. And when you combine climbing with Rivali's Gale, the two make for a powerful duo. And I can't tell you how much I missed it when I played Tears of the Kingdom. Tulin's ability is great, but I'll take Falco's Magic Wind any day of the week. But back to the Great Plateau. This tutorial is excellent for how it seamlessly teaches you all the game's core mechanics and for giving you opportunities to play with them before throwing you into the, comparatively, much larger sandbox filled with even more challenges to overcome. And I haven't even talked about the shrines and the treasures you find within them that only further expand your moveset. At the start of each Great Plateau Shrine, a new rune is added to your Sheikah Slate. These four runes function as your permanent items for the rest of the game. Magnesis, which allows you to move any metal object, bombs that can be detonated remotely, stasis, which freezes objects in place, and cryonis, which creates pillars of ice from any body of water. Like most things in Breath of the Wild, however, the potential of these runes goes beyond my short descriptions. With Magnesis, you can swing objects wildly to attack even the most resilient enemies, and in some cases, this proves to be more effective than the weapon you have on hand. Bombs can be used for cutting down trees or launching Link high in the air, one of the many crazy tricks that speedrunners use all the time. Objects frozen with stasis can be struck to build their potential energy so that, when they're unfrozen, they get launched at potentially blazing speeds, which can have multiple uses in combat, puzzle solving, and even traversal, and cryonis can be used on literally any body of water, even vertical streams of water like waterfalls. If you need some cover in the middle of an intense battle, Cryonis can be your best friend. And if you need something lifted off the ground and there happens to be some water underneath it, you guessed it, Cryonis is useful here too. Admittedly, this is the most situational rune of the bunch, but compared to how situational some past Zelda items were, Cryonis definitely has more uses. All of these are great in their own ways. And once you complete the last shrine on the plateau, you essentially have everything you need to explore all of Hyrule. Everything except the paraglider. The old man tells you to meet him at the Temple of Time, and when you reach the temple, the goddess statue you may have seen if you came here earlier will now be glowing. The spirit orbs you got from completing the shrines can now be traded for an upgrade to your health or stamina at any goddess statue. I typically prioritize stamina, but even this is something Breath of the Wild gives you the power to choose. Once you meet with the old man, he removes his disguise and reveals himself as the spirit of King Rome, the last king of Hyrule before the kingdom fell to the wrath of Calamity Ganon a hundred years ago. The king brings Link up to speed. Ancient, powerful machines, the divine beasts and guardians, the latter of which we've already had the delightful pleasure of meeting, were uncovered during an excavation mission as Hyrule prepared for the Calamity. They were programmed to be used against Ganon, with four champions chosen to pilot the four divine beasts. Link was the fifth champion who served as the princess's appointed knight as the wielder of the Blade of Evil's Bane. But when Calamity Ganon awakened, he pulled out the reverse Uno card, using his power to corrupt the guardians and the divine beasts to obey his will. The kingdom of Hyrule fell. King Rome and the champions lost their lives, all except Link, though he was mortally wounded, and was taken to the Shrine of Resurrection to heal, a process that took 100 years and made him lose his memories. With no one left to face the Calamity, Princess Zelda took it upon herself to use her sacred power to hold him at bay, confining the two of them to Hyrule Castle. She's been keeping him there for the past century, all the while waiting for Link to recover so he can defeat Ganon once and for all. King Rome begs Link to do what he must to save his daughter. The king points him in the direction of Kakariko Village to meet with the Sheikah tribe leader Impa, but the ultimate goal is to destroy Ganon, and with the paraglider in hand, you can finally go anywhere you want. The world is yours to explore. Now go. Once you leave the plateau, Breath of the Wild becomes almost a different game entirely. So many things are now possible the instant you set foot in Hyrule Field, to the point where it's almost overwhelming, and I say that in the best possible way. Unlike other open world games that have been criticized for not offering much in the way of player agency, most notably in their main missions creating a disconnect with the actual open world, Breath of the Wild is driven by player agency. You decide exactly what you want to do before facing Ganon. Aside from this main objective, you aren't required to do 
anything else. Now, obviously, the game is designed in a way to encourage players to actively seek out all the wondrous things that await them. The devs want you to experience this enormous playground they've built. The thing that will drive most players at first is wanting to make Link stronger before storming Hyrule Castle. It is possible to beat the game immediately after leaving the Great Plateau, but unless you're a speedrunner or someone who has mastered the game after sinking countless hours into it, most of your attempts will probably look a little something like this. <laughs> There are many ways to prepare yourself for the final showdown. The most obvious is completing shrines, which are everywhere, to exchange spirit orbs for health and stamina upgrades. Shrines can either be found in plain sight or by solving a particular environmental puzzle in the world itself. Shrine quests can be accepted to provide you with hints on how to uncover these buried shrines or how to find the ones that are tucked away and more sneakily hidden. But shrine quests in a lot of instances can often be completed before you accept them. This young lad in Rito Village tells you to make your way to a lone setter tree in the Hebrew mountains and look to the northwest to spot a giant bird in the snow, revealing the location of a hidden shrine. Though it may be more difficult to find without this hint, it's certainly possible. I remember finding this shrine out of pure luck on my first playthrough. Now, as for shrine quests that unearth a shrine, you're much less likely to accidentally discover these. Many of them are tied to riddles, and the aha moment when I figure out what I need to do elicits that oh-so-sweet and familiar feeling of satisfaction that comes with puzzle solving in Zelda games. These are undoubtedly my favorite types of shrine quests with the ones you receive from Cass, the fan-favorite Rito musician, being the best of the bunch. I'm so glad he was given more attention in the Champion's Ballad DLC. I'd say that the shrine quests tied to trials and minigames, though, are my second favorite type. They can range from a humorous endurance contest between Link and a couple of Gorons, to self-contained mini-dungeon-like areas, like the three labyrinths that reward you with the Barbarian Armor set, and the most famous of these, Eventide Island, where you're stripped of all of your items, forcing you to use the resources on the island to survive as you return these three orbs to their pedestal. There are 136 shrines in the game if you count the extra 16 added with the DLC. They serve as a good motivator to explore because of the promising rewards you obtain from conquering their trials, and there are enough of them scattered around the world to ensure that even newcomers to open world games will be able to find a decent chunk of them and rest easy knowing that they aren't skipping over too much of the game's content. But you need to be well equipped for what awaits you, both in shrines and in the world itself. You're not just going to be dealing with the same basic ass red bacoblins all the time. Some enemies can sport a lot of health, so you need better weapons. A lot of weapons can be acquired in any of the hundreds of chests hidden around Hyrule. You can also just get better weapons by stealing them from enemies, but you're not going to be taking more than a couple of hits in those raggedy ass clothes you've got on. So you've either got to round up some ingredients through scavenging and hunting to cook meals that give you extra temporary hearts or boost your defense and attack stats, or find some better armor, some of which can be found, but most of which is sold in shops. Except there's one small problem. You're broke as f and you can no longer rely on breaking pots and cutting weeds to make a quick buck like in the old days. One of the most surefire ways to earn money in this game is by visiting stables and towns and doing favors for NPCs, who will often reward you with rupees for your troubles. Whatever they ask you to do though, 9 times out of 10, you're gonna have to explore the world. You might even have to climb a mountain or two to get to where you need to go. And while you're doing this, you might find some ore. You can break it apart to find gems, opening up another avenue for making money if you decide to sell them. And since you've already come this far, you might as well scan your surroundings in case there's a shrine nearby. And would you look at that, there's one right there off in the distance. Might as well knock it out while you're here, and get one step closer to a stamina upgrade, so you can climb more mountains and find more precious ore to mine. And is that a f***ing cyclops? I mean, you have some decent weapons that you got from taking out an enemy camp on the way here, as well as the ones you found in that shrine you just completed. Maybe you should try killing him. He may drop some materials that fetch a high price. Oh, better yet, he dropped weapons that are even more powerful than the ones you currently have, and what was my point again? Right, there's a lot of things you can do to make Link stronger. There's no clear-cut method of accomplishing this goal and no clear-cut angle to approach it from. It's all up to you. You can always stick to the main quest if you do prefer to have that extra bit of guidance. It's perfect for players who may feel overwhelmed by how much freedom they're given. The best part about the main quest is that once you feel comfortable enough to break away from it and venture out into the world on your own, there's nothing stopping you from being able to do that. There's nothing that locks you into a specific path until the game decides to let you go. If you think about it, Breath of the Wild's tutorial continues way beyond the Great Plateau. If you make a beeline toward Kakariko Village per King Rome's instructions, you'll find a shrine that puts your newly acquired paraglider to the test, run into an NPC who will tell you about the decayed guardians and the active ones that chase down anyone who tries to get close to the castle, climb your first Sheikah Tower to fill in more of your map, complete another shrine located between the dueling peaks, where you can find the first piece of the climbing gear armor set, stumble upon the first stable where NPCs will tell you how to catch and register your first horse, meet Hestu who will tell you about Korok seeds if you haven't managed to find any yet, and in 
in Kakariko Village, the combat shrine here teaches you about the Flurry Rush and Parry. There's a nearby Great Fairy Fountain that you'll no doubt run into, where you'll learn that you can upgrade your armor with the materials you collected, giving you yet another reason to explore. The quest you get from Impa leads you to Hateno Village where you'll be able to give your Sheikah Sleep more functionality. And this clever, brilliantly disguised tutorial just keeps going. It doesn't truly end, I'd say, until you conquer Varuda. Zora's Domain is the first region most new players will head toward because it's the closest one to Kakariko Village. And what do you know? It's designed to be the most beginner-friendly of the bunch, especially with Sidon serving as your guide as you navigate around all the slippery cliffs to reach the domain. This quest is also how you get properly introduced to Lionels. And this is where many new players will be put in their place. You can also just, you know, not do any of this. If something else catches your eye, like maybe that giant bird in the sky, or whatever man-made horror has made Death Mountain its home, you can make either of them your primary goal, even if no one has told you to go there. There is stuff to do everywhere in Breath of the Wild's world. It is near impossible to stay focused on just one thing. And so, going back to the scenario I painted earlier, completing an NPC quest to earn money to buy some armor can suddenly turn into a two-hour tangential little adventure where you find some ore on the side of a mountain, take out a shrine or two, face a mini-boss in the overworld, maybe find a couple of Koroks here and there who will give you gold Hershey kisses that you may or may not know what to do with yet because you may or may not have ignored the recommended route and may or may not have run into Hestu, and who knows what else will catch your eye before you ultimately realize that you haven't even completed the quest objective yet. The entire reason you set out on this escapade in the first place. This is the average Breath of the Wild experience, and it never feels like you're wasting your time. Because spending even just a short amount of time exploring the world, whether you decide to continue the story or go on a detour, you are always making progress. And even on the off chance that a detour doesn't yield anything that can be quantified, like more rupees or another spirit orb or another restless cricket to violently stuff into your pouch, basically anything that makes a number go up, with how beautiful and detailed Hyrule is in this game, exploration will always bear something of value. Often, it can be something as simple as a gorgeous view. As if there already wasn't enough to do, the expansion pass adds even more content. Both DLC packs add new chests in the world, containing items and iconic armor from the series' history. And I like how the search for these items serves as a test of your knowledge of the world. You're only given vague hints concerning the whereabouts of each item, through Tracy's rumor mill and Misko the Bandit's journals. But it is so worth going out of your way to obtain these. The Phantom Armor set is my favorite by far in terms of looks, and it boosts your attack power as an added bonus. All of these look great great though. All of them. There was even a tie-in with Xenoblade 2 where they added Rex's salvager suit, since Monolith Soft aided in Breath of the Wild's development. Now if only they used the DLC as an opportunity to add in the amiibo exclusive costumes. I was always bummed that I couldn't get these because I missed out on these amiibo when they were released for the first time. Nintendo reprinted them recently and now I have them all, aside from 8-Bit Link, and I don't have any of the Breath of the Wild ones either. What's neat is that by scanning either Twilight Princess Link or the Smash Bros series Link, you can unlock Epona. I like to think that you just pluck her from some alternate timeline when you do this. The second DLC pack is definitely the more interesting of the two, with the added story content that fleshes out some of the champions more. And in terms of gameplay, the Great Plateau keeps proving itself as one of Breath of the Wild's greatest strengths with the one hit obliterator challenge. It's super nerve wracking trying to avoid getting hit when you can get one shotted by anything. I was hoping that this would become a permanent weapon, but alas, it wasn't meant to be. Instead, once you finish the DLC, Link gets a goddamn motorcycle. This thing teeters on the edge of what the f is this doing in a Zelda game, but honestly, I couldn't care less. It's a bizarre but awesome reward that gave me an excuse to spend just a bit more time in this breathtaking world. It can't be overstated just how much of the fun that comes from exploring is enhanced by the serenic presentation and soundtrack. This is my favorite art style in the series. It's a perfect mixture of every Zelda art style that has preceded it, and the end result is nothing short of amazing. Despite running on a toaster that can often have a hard time keeping a steady frame rate when a scene gets too busy with particle effects, foliage, and other taxing graphical assets, Breath of the Wild's timeless art direction means that it looks just as beautiful as it did when it came out six years ago, and it will continue to hold up for years to come. The cell shading, the warm colors, the superb lighting. I mean, just look at how the light from the sun and moon bounces off of the grass, the water, the sand. The kingdom may not be in the healthiest state, but nature prevails in this world, and its beauty creates an atmosphere that evokes such comforting and meditative vibes. And I know that some of you will groan at me even mentioning this, but if you have a legal copy of the game and a way to legally dump it onto your computer, might I recommend trying it out on an emulator? I think that doing this really highlights how strong 
strong the art style is. You can make the game look sharper and run smoother, but the art style still does most of the heavy lifting. Even the Wii U runs the game pretty well, in spite of some technical hiccups like in Towns, and it's a shame that the gamepad features from early builds of Breath of the Wild are missing in the final release. Speaking of Towns, they each have their own personality and charm to them to a degree that hasn't been seen before. The construction of these towns is fitting for the culture and lifestyle of each race, and the character designs have never been so varied, with the exception of Hylians who, sadly, are probably the most generic they've ever looked. Apparently their faces were designed in a character creator similar to the Mii Maker, but whatever. Zoras are designed after different species of fish like sharks and stingrays. Rito actually look like bird people now instead of humans with beaks and wings. Gorons have more unique features and have the absolute funniest facial expressions. Gerudo women are tall and buff, reflective of their status as warriors. The Sheikah display a very strong eastern influence, as does Kakariko village itself. Hyrule has never felt so real. The architecture of these towns, the world building, and the history here adds this sense of authenticity to the kingdom that does wonders for my immersion. And the minimalistic soundtrack takes this immersion to even greater heights. I wasn't always a fan of Breath of the Wild's subdued OST. There's a greater emphasis on more gentle, ambient pieces of music here. Many times there is no music, with the exception of the piano, that'll chime in every now and then, but I have come to really dig this game's musical direction. Breath of the Wild's world is in ruins, and the music conveys that it is slowly healing itself. The soundtrack also adds to the feeling of solitude as you explore. You don't have a companion in this game, unless you count Wolf Link who you can summon with the amiibo, but I don't. I know I've expressed my indifference towards a few of Link's previous companions, but not having anyone by my side this time, and not hearing means there's nothing to distract me from just how sad all of this is. The world wasn't always this lonely. People lived here. People died here. I remember how my heart sank when I came across the ruins of Lon Lon Ranch for the first time. I knew it wasn't the same exact ranch from Ocarina of Time, but that didn't stop the memories from flooding in, making this sight all the more upsetting. The game does also have its share of more traditional sounding tracks as well. I love each of the town themes, especially Rito Village's take on Dragon Roost Island from Wind Waker. Running into your first guardian out in the field is an unforgettable moment, in large part thanks to the anxiety inducing song that accompanies the encounter. Riding your horse at night plays this soothing version of the main Zelda theme. I know I haven't talked about the story or characters yet, but I adore each of the champion themes, with Mifa's being my favorite by far. It's such a beautiful, somber melody. It always stirs my emotions whenever I listen to it, more so after learning about Mifa's tragic fate and her closeness to Link and the family she left behind. Hyrule Castle is probably my favorite track overall. It's a fittingly epic song for the final dungeon, or more like the only dungeon, and I really like how the instrumentation changes depending on whether you're inside or outside of the castle. Then you have tracks that just straight up slap, like the battle music, which is a perfect segue for me to talk about the combat for a bit. Combat, especially starting off, can be incredibly chaotic. You have to play super carefully with your low health pool and pitiful defenses. Enemies in this game have some serious beef with Link. Multiple enemies can attack you at once, try to snipe you from afar, throw rocks at you, they even throw each other. Going up against a whole mob is usually dangerous, but when you get into the rhythm of things, battles become incredibly satisfying. You're constantly on the move as your weapons keep breaking so you have to scrounge for more in the middle of fights. Enemies get flung around when you pound into them or create a shockwave with a two-handed weapon or blow them up with bombs or any nearby explosive barrier. 
barrels, gaining the high ground, jumping off, and taking out your bow to slow time down to get as many headshots in as you can before landing or your stamina runs out, feels just as amazing as it looked in the trailers. Finding clever uses for your runes only makes the combat more exhilarating. And of course, the flurry rush just makes you feel like a badass, especially when you manage to pull it off at the last second, right when you notice an enemy in the corner of your eye trying to get a cheap shot in. This is especially fun to pull off against Lionels, who, on their own, can be just as fun going up against as a large group of monsters. When at its best early on, Breath of the Wild has the most thrilling combat in the series, and I am always in awe at how pros are able to make the combat look like something out of a spectacle fighter. Seriously, how is shit like this even possible? I think most Breath of the Wild players reach a point where they start exploring simply for the sake of it, in hopes of finding something unexpected, something magnificent, or just anything that will leave a lasting impact. I remember when I hit that point, when running around the Farin and Elden regions, chances are you'll lay eyes on the dragons Farosh and Dinral without any warning. The first time I found one of them, I was in awe, both at the dragons themselves and how I hadn't heard any mention of them. And since the dragon just showed up without any provocation, without having to start a specific quest to make it spawn or anything like that, it made it all the more surprising. And what ended up happening is that my curiosity motivated me to seek out the other dragons. But no matter where I went or what time of day it was in the Nehru, I couldn't find the third one. So I figured maybe this one is an exception, and it only appears after making enough progress in the story or something. So I forgot about it for a bit, and while I was hunting for shrines on Mount Nehru one day, I made my way to the peak, and I found the dragon. It wasn't flying around like the other two because it was corrupted by malice. So I helped it. And now, Nydra too could freely fly through the skies of Hyrule again. Even after knowing about the dragons, the game was still able to catch me off guard with the last one. Not only that, I found the Spring of Wisdom here, where I not only learned that I could shoot an arrow at the dragons to get pieces of their scales, horns, claws, and fangs, but I correctly assumed that there must be other springs out there, the springs of power and courage, and searching for them led me to a slew of other discoveries that I could literally spend the whole day going over. The dragons showed me that Hyrule wasn't this static place. It was a living, breathing entity, made more evident by how the weather could randomly change, and how I had to take it and the topography into account when exploring because of just how much they affected how I explored the world. The Death Mountain area, for instance, is scorching hot. You'll learn the hard way if you try entering this region using an ordinary heat resistance effect that it won't do jack sh to prevent you from bursting into flames. You need the flame guard effect, which you can obtain by making an elixir using a fireproof lizard. The mountain is filled with fire variants of certain enemies, and this is where any ice weapons you may have will really get a chance to shine. You'll encounter the igneo variant of stone taluses here as well. You might try pulling out some bomb arrows to make quick work of them, only to regret your decision. And if you don't feel like gliding everywhere which can be awkward when trying to get into a cave with a low ceiling, this is where the minecarts come into play. Hop into one and use a remote bomb to launch it across the track. Death Mountain is just one example of how, depending on what region you're in, you'll often have to rethink how to go about combat and traversal. The Farron region has a particularly dangerous element to consider, lightning. Thunderstorms can form at any time in Hyrule, but Farron is where they're the most common. It can be quite shocking the first time you notice a bolt of lightning knock down a tree not far from where you are, and your first reaction may even be, damn, that was pretty cool. But that can quickly turn into confusion and then fear when you notice that Link's metal equipment starts to generate static and... This is how you'll learn of the importance of always carrying non-conductive equipment around with you. But who's to say you can't turn this inconvenience around and make it work in your favor? Just place a metal object next to an enemy and let Mother Nature do the work. Lightning will also be accompanied by rain, making surfaces slippery and the act of climbing a near impossibility. Yes, this can often be more annoying than anything given how frequently it rains, and often at the most inopportune times. But don't lie and say that you weren't impressed by how even rain has an impact on gameplay the first time you play the game. Rain doesn't always have to be an inconvenience either though. Your fire and bomb arrows may be useless, but shock arrows become incredibly deadly in rainy weather, especially against groups of enemies. One more example. Gerudo Desert forces you to deal with sand and a different temperature depending on the time of day. It's hot during the day and cold at night, so you need both heat and cold resistant gear in the same area. The desert tundra is expansive, and the sand limits Link's mobility on foot. Thankfully, sand seals can provide you with a way of swiftly surfing across the sand. They are exclusive to the Gerudo region, but be careful 
because so are the Molduga. This mini boss likes to hide in the sand and uses sound to determine your position, but by throwing a bomb and letting it roll, the Molduga won't know the difference between it and Link. Let the bastard eat the bomb and detonate it, and you know what to do from here. Without a doubt, my favorite mini boss in the game, and probably my favorite boss type enemy in general, excluding Calamity Ganon if we're being real here, but we'll get to that later. I want to bring more attention to the game engine Breath of the Wilds is built in, because yes, it too plays its role in making the world feel alive. Rolling boulders downhill doesn't even begin to cover the extent of the game's physics. Wind can make the smallest of bushfires spread, and even create updrafts that can be used to gain altitude with your paraglider. Link and monsters alike will ragdoll when hit hard enough, and let me tell you, I'll never forget the first time one hit from an enemy sent me rolling down a hill for what felt like a minute. Sand and snow may be a pain to run through on foot, but they're perfect for shield surfing if you can find a slope. It's harder to do on grass and pretty much impossible to pull off on rocky terrain, but rain doesn't just make walls slippery, it makes everything slippery. So Shield Surf away. Stasis is arguably the most fun rune to use, as it is inherently tied to the physics engine. Too many times have I thought I've seen every possible use of this ability, only to be proven wrong on every occasion. It's truly an enigma how this doesn't make the game bug out or crash. It just goes to show how fine-tuned and polished Breath of the Wild is. Getting the physics to work this smoothly was no easy feat. All of this is to say that I really want Nintendo to release that 8-bit Breath of the Wild prototype to the public. Make it happen, you cowards! One of my fondest memories of learning just how dynamic the world is was when I was exploring the Hebra region. I was melting these chunks of ice with fire arrows to see if they were hiding anything, and at one point I stepped away for a bit and came back only to realize that the ice was melting on its own. I thought that this was some kind of bug, as the ice would melt more the closer I got to it. When I put two and two together and found out that the heat from the flame blade on my back was the thing causing the ice to melt, I smiled like a freaking dope. It is amazing that something like this was thought of and implemented, and there are dozens of other small details like this that each gave me a similar feeling of elation when I discovered them, like using shade to stay cool in the desert, striking flint with a metal weapon to set up a campfire, being able to feed the adorable dogs, using elemental arrows on choo-choo jellies to change their elemental properties, which you can then use at the Hateno dye shop to dye your clothes. I didn't even know about this shop for the longest time. I somehow completely skipped it during my first playthrough. Like it wasn't that long ago that I discovered that Cooking during a blood moon will enhance any dish you make. I also didn't know about how the game accounts for nearly every way you can sequence break, like having Zelda give you a brief explanation of a divine beast when entering a particular region if you never went to see Impa, or playing an alternate cutscene if you manage to avoid Sidon on your way to Zora's Domain. Every facet of this game is overflowing with detail. I want to touch on another series convention that Breath of the Wild breaks, needing to play the game by yourself. Now, for the longest time, I dismissed the mention of this in the January 2013 Direct as just a hypothetical what-if scenario, and that it wasn't literal confirmation that Breath of the Wild would feature multiplayer or something. And what do you know, there is no multiplayer. But let's think back to Zelda 1 for a second. It's a single-player game that kids found a way to play cooperatively with friends by sharing their discoveries with one another, because finding all of the game's secrets was too big of a task for one person alone. In the age of the internet, Breath of the Wild was able to bring back this this unique kind of cooperative play. Instead of exchanging information at the park or at school, it was now happening over the internet. Dark Souls is the example a lot of people may think of as I talk about this, a series that can be played alone, but is enhanced when played with an online connection, knowing that the messages you can find are from other players, so it never really feels like you're alone on your adventure, knowing that others are riding along with you. I think these kinds of games are just better if you play them with somebody at your side. This story I'm about to share happened when I was playing Tears of the Kingdom, but I'll share it anyway as I feel it can also apply to Breath of the Wild. A friend was with me when I was tackling the regional phenomena and side quests in Zora's Domain. A lot of the quests in this region forced us to solve riddles to figure out what we needed to do. One of my favorites was Secret Treasure Under the Great Fish. I don't know why it took us so long to realize that the Great Fish referred to the giant ass fish statue in the domain and that this was the bridge the riddle was talking about. We were too preoccupied focusing solely on the waterfall part of the riddle that we were checking damn near every set of waterfalls except for the ones that we needed to go to. But it wasn't the quest itself, or the cave we found after figuring out the correct area to search in, that made this all so memorable. What I treasure the most was the experience of piecing it all together with somebody else. With my friend. Preparing this video has been a daunting task. Not just because Breath of the Wild is a game I love dearly and I wanted to do it justice, but because I had to come to terms with the fact that I can't cover everything about it. 
I try to be as in-depth as I can with the games I talk about, but Breath of the Wild is simply too gargantuan for me to talk about all the little things it has to offer. There's so much I still want to gush about, like how you can see shooting stars and collect the fragment left behind if you run to where it landed, or how Akala is my favorite region for the fall colors and maple trees, or how excellent the build up to the Master Sword is. Characters who recognize Link as the legendary hero will ask him about the sword, which compels you to go out and search for it. Your search will eventually bring you to the Lost Woods, where you have to navigate the thick fog and go in the right direction in a callback to A Link to the Past, or I guess Zelda one if you want to be really technical. And then you make it to the end and see the sword waiting for you. And you even reunite with the great Deku Tree. How's it going, old friend? Sorry about lighting your insides on fire last time. When you try to pull it out without enough hearts, the Deku Tree will stop you before you kill yourself. But you can try again and he won't stop you the second time, resulting in one of the funniest game overs in a game with endless potential for funny game overs. But I can't stress enough just how amazing it felt finding the Master Sword for the first time just by using my knowledge of the past games. It's one of the many ways Breath of the Wild honors the legacy of the series and how it still retains the spirit of Zelda. I can go on and on, so I'll just end this section off with this. Breath of the Wild is the best open world game I've ever played. This world gives me the freedom to do whatever I want, go wherever I want, and play however I want. This world is dense enough where there's always something to do, and active enough to encourage me to want to explore more of it, learn more about it, and uncover more of its secrets. This game is a masterpiece of design, and how all of its systems come together to create an addictive gameplay loop that can keep me playing for hours on end. This is the most fun I've ever had with an open world game. And while something like Tears of the Kingdom technically has more content and an arguably more impressive world and more impressive mechanics, nothing will compare to the first time Zelda attempted to be this ambitious. And it's why I believe Breath of the Wild is the only game since Ocarina of Time that has been able to replicate that game's level of impact. It was the first of its kind, and it did so many things right on its first attempt. However, it is a first attempt. And as much as I'd like to continue singing the game's praises, I do also want to talk about the areas where I feel Breath of the Wild falls flat. In some cases so hard that it makes me yearn for the way things used to be. Breath of the Wild wasn't immune to falling into one of the most common trappings of being an open world game, quantity over quality. This may come as a shock, but I'm actually not referring to the Koroks here. There are 900 of these little guys, and yes, attempting to find them all will net you a one-way ticket to an asylum, but the sheer number of Koroks and how you can guarantee to find one at nearly every turn at the top of every lonely mountain or tree is just another way of the game trying to reward you for exploring. I don't think people are expected to find all of them. It's borderline impossible without a guide of some sort. There are as many Koroks as there are, so that even the most amateur of explorers can beat the game having found a decent chunk of them, like with the shrines. Plus, you only need about half of the total 900 to fully upgrade your inventory's capacity, which still isn't easy, but it's definitely more manageable. I managed to find over 300 this time without any help from the internet. Granted, I did attempt to go after all of them years ago, so some of these were still fresh in my memory, but still, the Koroks aren't that bad. Except for these. These can eat a dick. Where I think Breath of the Wild stretches itself too thin is with its side quests and the shrines. Let's start with the side quests. There are some good ones here, some that manage to get a laugh out of me, like the shrine quest with a lady who will kill you if you step on her flowers enough times, and some involve playing fun minigames or solving interesting puzzles. There's even a few great ones, but there are simply too many nothing side quests. You know the ones. The side quests that serve no real interesting purpose other than being generic open world filler content so that they can say that the game has nearly a hundred side quests, but in reality only a handful of them were crafted with real care and intent. I consider a large chunk of the side quests to be busy work. The standard collect x amount of a certain item fare. They're a lot like those generic monster hunts and item requests from Xenoblade 1. That game is bloated with these kinds of quests as well, but the difference is that in Xenoblade it's much more likely that you'll be able to complete a bunch of these by just playing the game normally so long as you accepted them. Practically takes no effort in a lot of cases, and you get experience points, gold, gems, weapons, and armor for next to no trouble. In Breath of the Wild, these generic quests can be kind of out of the way, and some I just find to be a pain in the ass. Any quest that makes me collect a certain number of insects automatically gets put at the bottom of my priority list, because I'm an impatient person and I hate having to slow down to search for bugs that I end up scaring away most of the time anyways. I do find myself eventually completely 
completing some of these side quests accidentally like in Xenoblade. But you know what else I like more about Xenoblade? You automatically collect the rewards when you complete the task. In Breath of the Wild, I not only have to return to the quest giver and skip to some generic dialogue, sometimes my reward ends up being a f***ing carrot. This game needed way fewer of these side quests, and more along the lines of the shady customer side quest, or the 8th heroine side quest, or of course, the Terrytown side quest. Side quests that net me awesome rewards, teach me about an interesting landmark in the world, and or involve characters I care about. The Terrytown quest is a fan favorite, not just because it's also related to the quest where you buy your own house and get to decorate it with weapon mounts and flowers to scratch the itch of those who play Breath of the Wild like it's a life simulation game, but because Hudson is such a wholesome dude and you want to help bring his vision to life. And it ends with you bringing people from all across Hyrule together to build this lovely new community. And it is through these connections that new friendships and even new relationships are born. Terrytown represents Hyrule's unbreakable spirit, even after going through so much despair. It's up there with some of the best of Majora's Mask side quests, and frankly, Breath of the Wild needed way more side stories like this one. Before I get into the shrines, I want to go over my problems with the combat and the game's general difficulty balancing. I made it a point to say when the game is starting off when I was praising the combat earlier, because combat in Breath of the Wild is super fun in the beginning and gets worse the more you play. The more hearts you obtain, the easier it gets to find really powerful weapons, the more healing items you have on hand. Combat honestly becomes pretty boring. The challenge factor takes a nosedive. It just becomes too easy. I remember when the game first came out, people were comparing it to Dark Souls. Yeah, 2017 was the year of Dark Souls clones apparently. Now obviously this was a silly comparison, but I can kinda understand where it came from. During my first 10 hours or so with Breath of the Wild, I was dying left and right. I was taken aback by how aggressive enemies were and how much damage they dealt. Weapon durability took some time to get used to, I wasn't familiar with the timings for the flurry rush or parry, and I mean I had a like no health, and my armor wasn't up to snuff. But it was fun. Link's squishiness forced me to come up with my own solutions to come out on top in a fight. It forced me to scavenge for weapons and materials. It forced me to engage with the game in a way that unfortunately, I couldn't be inclined to do anymore once I hit a point where I had armor that was strong enough to prevent me from getting one-shotted, weapons that were so good that I didn't want to waste them on some bacoblins just to get a boko club in return, and enough cooked meals to feed the king himself. And even when I did have to fight, combat was too easy now. The great fairies upgraded my armor so much that enemies were only doing a couple of hearts worth of damage per hit. I could pause the game at any time to eat and recover any hearts I did lose because Link is some kind of freak of nature and can eat 30 stakes without gaining any weight. Champion abilities allowed me to summon an AoE lightning attack, be invincible while guarding, and come back to life when I died with even more hearts than I had before. And once I did get the hang of the flurry rush, it was over. This mechanic is so f***ing broken because you don't even have to be in any real danger in order to activate it. For a mechanic that should be risk versus reward, there is very little risk, and it essentially makes the parry obsolete in most encounters. I will commend how the game will fill the world with stronger variants of enemies the more progress you make. I think it's tied to how many main quests and shrines you've completed. It's a good way of ensuring that the difficulty of areas scales along with you, so that some places aren't always filled with low-level enemies. It's a clever workaround for a game as open-ended and non-linear as this one. I'd also be lying if I said that combat stops being fun out right. After all, I always have the option to make my own fun with runes and the game's wacky physics, and there is joy to be had being an overpowered short king and going overkill on even the most basic enemies. Lynels are always a treat to fight, and Calamity Ganon is my favorite boss in the game. Even if I ignore the stupid decision to have his HP if you freed all the divine beasts, there's just less and less of a reason to fight the more hours you put into the game. When I start going out of my way to avoid enemies because combat isn't fun enough anymore to take part in, that's a problem. Sure, they drop material materials that are often needed to upgrade armor, but like I said earlier, I almost regret upgrading my armor so much because the game becomes too much of a cakewalk. With a high enough defense stat, even silver monsters won't pose much of a threat anymore because I know somebody will bring it up. Yes, the DLC includes a harder difficulty called Master Mode, but I don't think it solves the balancing issues, namely because now, the game is just cheap. All enemies in the world have been bumped up a tier, so on the Great Plateau, those red bacoblins have all been replaced with blue ones. Yet the area selection of weapons has not been tweaked to accommodate the increased health bars you'll be having to deal with, so it can take multiple tree branches and boko clubs to defeat one bacoblin, turning weapon durability into something I am really not a fan of anymore. Enemy health will also replenish if you don't keep attacking so dealing with groups becomes even more of a chore. Also, there's a Lionel in the tutorial area now. Not gonna lie, that's pretty funny. Some may say, well, just avoid combat as much as you can until you can find better weapons. 
But now the problem of having little incentive to take part in combat is even worse. From the little I've played of it and from what I've heard from people online, Master Mode is a sorry excuse for a hard mode and actively makes Breath of the Wild's combat less enjoyable. And when I don't enjoy the core combat, it becomes harder to overlook all of the other cracks related to it, like the lack in weapon variety and how spears are blatantly overpowered, the lack of unique combos outside of these basic strings, the inconsistency in when enemies decide to get staggered from my attacks, the f***ing abysmal inventory management that gets worse as you're able to carry more, and you're forced to scroll three counties over just to see all the equipment you have on hand, the absolutely pathetic selection of enemies. Where are the Dark Nuts, Deku Babas, P-Hats, Like Likes, Redeads and Gibdos, the Dongos? The same goddamn types of enemies can be found everywhere. Lizalfos come in different flavors depending on the region's climate, but it's not enough. And they're pushovers once you discover that an arrow of the opposite element is enough to one-shot them. The small pool of distinct monsters not only gets visually boring, it makes the world feel smaller than it actually is, because no matter where you are, you're fighting the same types of enemies. And don't even get me started on the overabundance of Henoxes and Stone Taluses. There are 40 of each. You think that's enough? And the strategy to defeat them is the same nearly every time. Molduga is my favorite mini boss, not just because it's the most interesting to fight, but because there's only four in the world and they're only found in the desert. There should have been more region exclusive mini bosses like this, and this would have given players something else to look forward to when entering a new area. Before I move on, I do want to clear something up because I've only alluded to it up until now. Yes, I kind of like weapon durability. I didn't for a long time, but I've come to accept that this game wouldn't be half as fun without it. It is integral to Breath of the Wild's identity. I don't love the mechanic completely, and I'm not particularly fond of the Master Sword and the Hylian Shield being able to break as well, but I understand you can't have unbreakable equipment in a game with a durability system, not without some caveats. Weapon durability is also why I feel the combat gets worse as the game goes on though. I love having to scramble for new weapons mid-fight, but it doesn't happen as often with late game weapons due to their higher durability. And again, the weapons I have are already crazy powerful, so why engage in fights when I'll likely just get something worse out of it? Even Tide Island is so cool because it reminds me of those early hours, when combat was primarily about survival and using your smarts to gain the upper hand. It's why I like the shrines in Tears of the Kingdom that have this same gimmick. Breath of the Wild should have had these, instead of over 20 damn tests of strength. <sighs> it's time, isn't it? I don't like shrines, a bold take I know. Many of the points brought up against shrines like how they're all aesthetically the same, have the same music, contain the same enemies, and how a bunch of them are simply a slight variation on a puzzle you saw in two other shrines before it, these problems wouldn't be so severe if there were simply less shrines. Too many times have I entered a shrine and sworn that I'd already completed this one on this playthrough, but no, it's just that so many shrines recycle the same ideas, which makes me wonder why these couldn't have been combined to be one big mega shrine where you can see these ideas gradually evolve. I mentioned being a fan of the shrine quests, but a majority of them lead to these blessing shrines with only one chest and the monk who gives you a spirit orb. In these cases, you could argue that this is okay because the challenge came from completing the quest that unlocked this shrine, but I can't tell you just how disappointed I was when I got to the end of the Typhlo Ruins and conquered Eventide Island, only to be greeted with a blessing shrine. And it's not even consistent because not every puzzle-focused shrine quest leads to a blessing shrine. Tests of strength have you fight against a low level, mid level, or high level guardian robot that's fun the first couple of times when you're still learning their attack patterns. Also, the terror I felt the first time seeing this attack will forever be one of my favorite moments from my first playthrough, but they quickly lose their luster considering there are like 20 of these. Roughly 15% of the game's shrine count consists of tests of strength. That is absolutely ridiculous. By the way, 29 shrines are blessing shrines, so about 50 of Breath of the Wild's shrines either have nothing to them or just force you to fight the same enemy. Shrines that force you to use the gyroscope, this one where you have to play golf using your stasis ability, any shrine that I walk into and figure out the solution before I even gain control of Link, none of these are good. I hate to sound so harsh, but I can't help it. I just think so many shrines in this game are worthless. They're too brain dead, too frustrating, or too... Yeah, I don't want to be completely negative here. Synced Swing, Blue Flame, Melting Ice Hazard, nearly every shrine involving an electric current are really good. I had a lot of fun going through these. The Twin Peaks shrines are some of the most unique since they each contain the solution to the other. It's not hard to figure out, 
but it's memorable, it's different. And while these aren't technically shrines, the master trials that were part of the first DLC pack scratch that itch that I was talking about earlier, even Tide Island-esque challenge areas. These trials just make the tests of strength look more pathetic and unappealing. The master trials are no joke either. Even Tide has got nothing on these when it comes to difficulty. You feel like such a, well, master at the game after completing them, and the fully powered up Master Sword is an awesome reward. Now I actually want to use the damn thing outside of Hyrule Castle, guarding fights, and breaking rocks. And since I'm on the topic of the DLC, 16 shrines were added to the second DLC pack and they're around the same quality as some of the better ones in the base game. I think they were more comfortable letting these be more tricky, since most players will have already beaten the game and done a bunch of the original shrines before moving on to the Champion's Ballad content. For whatever reason, a bunch of these force you to use the gyroscope though, and I just want to know who the hell a that decision. We knew from the marketing at E3 that Breath of the Wild was going to contain somewhere in the range of 100 shrines. I was super impressed with the shrines they showed during the Treehouse livestreams, and how shrines, just like the open world, were designed in a way to encourage players to find their own creative solutions to complete them. So I was excited to learn that there were still a crap ton of shrines to look forward to. But the reality is that very few of the shrines in the final game feel like significant leaps in complexity and design from the ones on the plateau. Many shrines do have multiple solutions, intended or otherwise, so I can't exactly knock the game for allowing me to cheese a shrine. But at the same time, when I can just completely bypass and invalidate any challenge a shrine was supposed to pose, it makes me wish there were maybe more restrictions to prevent stuff like this. My attitude quickly changes from, wow, I can do that? To, wow, I can do that? Placing a bunch of restrictions in shrines would go against the game's core philosophy though, and I know that part of me just misses the more structured layouts of dungeons in the older games. Unfortunately, shrines are not a replacement for dungeons, not even close, which wouldn't be a bad thing if Breath of the Wild had traditionally designed dungeons to satisfy that craving, but it doesn't. Before I forget, there's something I want to bring up. During the 2014 Game Awards showcase, Miyamoto said this. This looks a bit suspicious. We must be near a dungeon. Mm. I am not exaggerating when I say that this was one of my most anticipated features of Breath of the Wild, being able to find dungeons in the open world while exploring, just like in Zelda 1. So imagine how let down I was when the game came out and I discovered that not only was this not implemented, but that there were only 4 dungeons in total, and that they were all basically souped up shrines. I know that probably makes me sound like a hypocrite considering I was just talking about how I would have liked certain shrines to be fused together to create one bigger shrine, but that doesn't mean I think this idea would make for a good dungeon, because the appeal of dungeons stems from many factors. The mix of combat and puzzles, well thought out and creative designs and aesthetics, bonus points if they have good music that elevates their atmosphere, and crucially, I'd say, getting a new item that the dungeon progressively tests you on until you mastered it. Zelda dungeons are large set pieces. They're supposed to feel like special events, where you fight a giant boss at the end to end it all with a bang. Divine beasts are conceptually very creative. Having to move different parts of their bodies or make them tilt to solve puzzles is is ingenious. At least that's what it feels like at first. The gimmick loses its wow factor when you realize just how plain and dull these dungeons are. They all have the same enemies, their makeup is identical, they're all really tiny and can be finished in a fraction of the amount of time it would take to finish a traditional Zelda dungeon, their puzzles aren't much more complicated than ones you find in shrines, and they all follow the same format of needing to activate five terminals before fighting the boss. And yeah, the bosses are a complete joke. They're all just slightly altered variations of one another and aren't all that dangerous. Well, Thunderbly can put up a good fight, but that's still 1 out of 4. It's a mystery how the team thought of leveling up the enemies in the open world to match Link's power level, but didn't think to do the same for the bosses. And don't even get me started on Dark Beast Ganon, he sucks, an absolutely terrible boss to end the game off on. Since Divine Beasts can be tackled in any order, since you already have every main item after leaving the plateau, and since Breath of the Wild ditches the one solution to every problem way of designing puzzles, Divine Beasts can't possibly have the same strong, handcrafted level design of traditional dungeons. It is the way that shrines and dungeons in this game are designed that sometimes makes me wish that I didn't have so much freedom. One of my favorite parts of the series suffered tremendously because of it. But it's not all bad, because not only is the fifth divine beast at the end of the champion's ballad leaps and bounds more intricate than any of the ones in the base game, and even has a unique boss at the end, but just look at Hyrule Castle. It's definitely not a traditional dungeon either, and with the right equipment, abilities, and enough stamina, you can breeze through the whole thing in a couple of minutes. But the castle is so big and complex in its layout that you won't want to do that. 
There's dozens of rooms, multiple branching paths in the interior, hidden areas including a small cave system, and a prison where you can find the Hylian shield. And in contrast to the Divine Beasts, it's all strengthened by the theming. This feels like a castle. It feels like a dungeon, and not like a bunch of shrine challenges haphazardly stitched together. There's actual cohesion to Hyrule Castle, much like how there's cohesion to the open world, which is a big part of what makes it so fun to explore. There's fun to be had just studying the layout and learning the architecture, figuring out how every area connects. And with all the cool weapons and rare materials and even quest objectives you can find in the castle, on top of the optional story details you can uncover by finding the King's Journal and Zelda's Diary, it makes me wish that Breath of the Wild had more dungeons like Hyrule Castle. Far and away, the dungeons were the part of the game that disappointed me the most when I first played it. I've seen some arguments that Hyrule itself is the dungeon this time around, and I can sort of understand that perspective. And the world is great enough on its own that the lack of traditional dungeons, frankly, doesn't hurt as much as it could have. But allow me to tell you about another game for a quick minute. Elden Ring is an open world game. It also has legacy dungeons, levels in its world that are closer in design to traditional Souls level design, a part of every FromSoft developed Souls-like that is universally praised. In Elden Ring, the vast open world and these dungeons live in harmony. The developers made the conscious decision to include levels that harken back to the way the older games were constructed, and the game is all the better for it. Imagine if all Elden Ring had that resembled the level design of previous FromSoft games were the catacombs and caves. The game would likely still be great because the world is the main attraction, but it definitely wouldn't be as great as it is. You can't convince me that proper dungeons wouldn't have made Breath of the Wild better, the same way that the game would be improved if there weren't so many filler shrines, and if there were more fleshed out side quests, and if it had more enemies, and if I could actually fill out both of my rows of hearts. A common response I've heard to all of this is that, this is all optional. You don't have to do all of the shrines. You don't have to do the side quests. You don't even have to do the Divine Beasts. And as for that last point, if we're being real, it actually makes for a more fulfilling endgame, when you have to battle the Blights back to back before facing Ganon, and when Ganon himself doesn't have half of his health bar f***ing obliterated. I have never been a fan of the argument that you can't criticize a game's side content simply because it's optional. I remember reading a few comments like these on my Metroid videos, when I talk about some of the cumbersome late game item cleanups, that I gave some of those games too much flack for something that isn't even required. I even remember somebody trying to tell me that these games aren't meant to be 100%ed, and that I had no right to complain because of that, even though your completion percentage is shown to you at the end, and is tied to specific endings, but whatever. I don't deny that I have more of a completionist mindset than others may have, but the fact is that a game that can make all of its content fun, regardless if it's optional or not, is a game that I will ultimately hold in higher regard, because I can say that I enjoyed everything about it. The funny thing about arguments like, you don't have to complete everything, is that they acknowledge that there are parts of a game that are less than stellar, parts where there is room for improvement. Some people get so up in arms when their favorite games get criticized, when in many cases, those criticisms come from other fans who simply want the next game to be even better. I don't know when I'll get around to making a video on Tears of the Kingdom, but what I'll say right now is that it does attempt to fix a few of Breath of the Wild's blemishes. How well it succeeded in these attempts is a discussion for another day. There's an attempt at telling a grander story in the sequel. The enemy variety is better. There are more reasons to fight, even in the late game, because monster parts are more lucrative with a new fuse ability. The towers are now less monotonous to activate, and serve a more useful purpose in gameplay by launching you high in the sky. Shrines can still be kind of hit or miss, and they double down on the quantity of them, but I'd argue that the best shrines in Tears of the Kingdom are way more interesting than the best ones in Breath of the Wild. Dungeons still aren't quite where I'd want them to be, but they are noticeably better, at least in their theming and for feeling more like actual locations that fit naturally in the world. There's even a suit that addresses the complaint of how annoying it is to climb in the rain. Breath of the Wild is amazing, and gave me and many others a one-of-a-kind experience. But it's okay and even beneficial to talk about its lesser components. It isn't infallible, and pretending that it is, and this goes for those who do the same kind of dick writing for Tears of the Kingdom even though that game has a whole new set of issues, would only send Nintendo the wrong message. Progress and growth can't be achieved if mistakes are never acknowledged. And regarding the whole conversation about which is better, the traditional formula or the open world format that Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom introduced, I don't think that one style is clearly better than the other. As I've talked about in my previous Zelda videos, there's a lot that I admire about the more linear games. And as I've talked about in this video, there's a lot that I admire about the non-linear games. A game that strives for a balance between the two is what I'd consider my ideal Zelda game to be.
My biggest problems with Breath of the Wild are ones that I can largely avoid. In a way, that's what's so lovely about it. I can choose to end my adventure whenever I want, and I get to choose how much of it I want to experience. I just wish I didn't have to limit my time in this world if I don't want to leave feeling jaded and burnt out by it. Now there's one last big thing I have left to talk about. There was one major reservation I still had about this non-linear Zelda game that I was never able to fully shake leading up to launch. How was the story going to play out? How are they going to tell a structured narrative when Nintendo themselves have said that the only thing you're required to do in this game is defeat Ganon? Even after that story-focused trailer at the Switch presentation gave the impression that they found a way to tell an active, compelling story, I was still left wondering how it was all going to play out. This is why I said early in the video that the first Breath of the Wild trailer is what comes to mind when I think of the perfect trailer. The game's final trailer, for as well directed and exciting as it is, is a tad misleading in how it framed the story segments. Turns out that these scenes that appeared to be happening in the present were actually flashbacks to the events from 100 years ago. Much of the plot has already happened when you start the game. The main reason Link has amnesia and has to recover his memories is so that he starts off just as clueless and lost as you. You and Link are both piecing together the events that transpired leading up to the Great Calamity, which is pretty brilliant. It allows for a story that can be delivered out of order, and it also makes sense in context. It's a clever way of telling a story in a game like this. But many people, including myself, were disappointed by the simple fact that we weren't able to play through these events ourselves, that we weren't able to spend time with the champions or Zelda, the former of whom are considerably underwhelming with how little screen time they have, and the stuff happening in the present day leaves a lot to be desired. Most of it plays out in the four regions as you work to help each race with their divine beast dilemma. But in cases like the Va Meadow and the Va Rudania questlines, Teba and Yunobo aren't the most riveting companions to latch onto, and in the Va Naboris questline, you infiltrate the Yiga clan's base of operations, which leads to a hilarious encounter with their leader, Master Koga, but for a clan made up of ex Sheikah members with a mission to kill any who oppose Ganon, they're very absent and inactive outside of this quest. Aside from the random ambushes you'll have to deal with in the world, and the stolen heirloom shrine quest in Kakariko Village, where you learn about Dorian's history with the Yiga and the terrible price he had to pay for betraying the clan. With every main quest I finished, I was left wanting more. So many of these feel rushed and underdeveloped, and I wasn't a fan of how disjointed everything felt. I missed how the previous games' stories developed with twists and turns along the way. I wanted more set pieces, like the boss fights against the Divine Beasts. Because every Divine Beast quest follows the same format and they all feel so isolated, it makes this aspect of Breath of the Wild's story feel, ironically, more formulaic than previous Zelda stories. And if there's one thing about Breath of the Wild that aggravates me, even to this day, it's Link. I know a lot of people like this version of Link, but I'm sorry. In my opinion, this is one of the stalest, driest iterations of the character in the whole series. He is such a blank slate, and wears the same vacant expression in so many of the game's most important scenes. Do you really remember me? Why is he just staring at her? What's so frustrating is that he does have a personality. You can see it shine through in the memories, like when he shows concern for Zelda's turmoil, or when he panics when he has to put up with her silly experiments. You can also see it in the dialogue options, the way he eats food, how he blushes when putting on the Vi outfit, how he shivers in the cold, the way he hums when he prepares a dish. <laughs> yeah. But it's such a stark juxtaposition to how he acts everywhere else. At least Ocarina of Time Link did little stretches. This dude doesn't have any idle animations. He's just standing there, menacingly! I know about the entry in Zelda's journal where she talks about Link being more reserved in this game, as he feels he has to silently bear every burden, a character detail that I am a fan of. But he clearly doesn't have a problem showing emotion when taking a selfie, yet he can't muster any kind of emotional response to his childhood friend vowing to protect him no matter what, or have any reaction upon learning that that same friend not only had romantic feelings for him, but that the Zora armor she made by hand for her future husband fits him perfectly? Link is distractingly inconsistent. I do like how even after being deprived of his memories, his courageous spirit remains intact and he was ready to spring into action as soon as he woke up from the Shrine of Resurrection. Zelda even brings attention to this quality of Link's character right before the final battle. But overall, this version of Link is such a bore. It's a shame considering how much I liked him in Wind Waker, Twilight Princess, and especially Skyward Sword. It's all the more confusing why this is the first game to not allow the player to name Link when this is the blandest he's been in a while.
Because I wasn't vibing with the way the narrative was playing out on my first playthrough, I wrote Breath of the Wild off as a Zelda story with very few redeeming qualities. It wasn't until very recently that I examined it for the first time without wishing it was more like what I expected it to be based on that final trailer. It has taken me 6 years, and while I still have problems with it, I am now able to appreciate the story that is trying to be told here. I always viewed the story as the weakest part of the game next to the dungeons, and while I do still miss the way the previous games told their stories, I've learned to love what Breath of the Wild has to say about legacy, expectations, and learning to move forward, and how it conveys these themes not so much through its plot, but through its characters. The Va Ruda and Va Nabor's questlines are my favorite of the Divine Beast missions for this very reason. On the Zora side, we have Sidon. On top of being a real bro to Link and being incredibly likable, and according to some f***able, is next in line for the throne, and is simply trying to do right by his people, even if the decisions he makes to accomplish this go against the values of certain individuals, such as enlisting Link's help to quell Varuda. Some of the older Zora blame Hylians for the Great Calamity and for the death of Mipha. Losing Mipha especially was a tremendous blow to everyone in the domain, as she was loved by all for her gentle and nurturing personality. Some of that may have rubbed off on Sidon, which would explain his overly friendly demeanor and willingness to put aside any resentment his people may have toward Link to ensure a bright future, not just for the Zora, but for all of Hyrule. I like to think that this is his way of honoring his late sister. Sidon is a natural born leader, but for some of us, we have to work harder to gain that same confidence. On the Gerudo side, there's Riju. Riju struggles to uphold the legacy of not just Arbosa, but her mother as well, the Gerudo chief that preceded her. She doubts her abilities to lead and protect her people, and those feelings are only accentuated with the recent awakening of Vana Boris that threatens the entire desert, and the theft of the Thunderhelm, the most prized possession of the Gerudo, a theft that happened under her watch. Riju is forced into an unfortunate position. It's a kind of pressure that nobody her age should have to experience. The scene where she puts on the Thunderhelm is one of my favorite moments. It's not only lighthearted since it's too big for her to wear properly, it's also a little sad because it reminds you that Riju is just a kid. A kid with massive shoes to fill, or in this case a massive helmet. Seeing her come into her own in Tears of the Kingdom filled me with a lot of joy. I felt proud of her. Out of all the champion successors, Riju is who I was rooting for the most. But no other character epitomizes the heart and soul of Breath of the Wild's narrative more than the Princess of Hyrule herself. I didn't think Skyward Sword's depiction of Zelda could be overthrown as my favorite incarnation of the character so soon. But here we have who I believe to be the best Zelda to date. Though she isn't an active agent in the present, Link's lost memories of the past are all centered around her. Zelda has the biggest responsibility of all, harnessing her sacred power to seal Ganon when the time comes. But after years and years, in spite of her best efforts, she has been unable to tap into it. As Ganon's return draws closer, the pressure to fulfill her duty slowly whittles away at her. But she must remain strong and unflinching so as to not be perceived as weak by the people who are counting on her. The desperation also gets the better of King Rome, as he begins to act more like a general than a father to Zelda. You can read his journal in the hidden study in the castle, where he acknowledges how harsh he's been towards her as of late, and how this has strained their relationship, and you learn that he never got the chance to patch things up with her. One of the memories shows an argument between the two. This Zelda is a bit of a bookworm, with a keen interest in the ancient Sheikah text specifically. On a day that she decided to skip her training to study the Guardians, her father scolds her, tells her that she's wasting her time playing scholar when the threat of Ganon looms over the entire kingdom. Hearing this from her father proves to be a heavy blow to Zelda's morale and self-confidence. I understand her frustration here so much. It's not as if her failure to unlock her power comes from a lack of trying. Even after finding her calling as a researcher, she's still doing everything she can to be what everybody else needs her to be, even if it's not what she wants for herself. She gives it her all, but it's still not enough. She's still letting everyone down. And as if she didn't already have enough weight on her shoulders, she now has to spend nearly every second of the day with the knight who wields the sword that seals the darkness. The hero revered by all of Hyrule, the chosen one who is now here to constantly remind Zelda of her own failures. Yet, Link eventually becomes the person she feels the most comfortable being around, the person she feels comfortable being herself with, the person she feels comfortable opening up to, 
Link, in turn, opens up to Zelda, and she realizes that everyone has their own set of hardships to bear, even if some of us choose to keep it inside for one reason or another. This is very likely the case for everyone in Hyrule. I've often heard complaints that it doesn't feel like the world in Breath of the Wild went through an apocalypse, because when you look around, sure, there's a lot of abandoned settlements and evidence of bloody battles that took place on that fateful day, but everyone just seems to be going about their normal, everyday lives, as if the events from 100 years ago never happened. And to that I say, yeah, what else are they supposed to do? Are they supposed to wallow and remain unhappy forever? Isn't it worth trying to find happiness again after such a horrible event? The world may have nearly ended, but that doesn't mean that people should stop living, because life marches forward. That doesn't mean that we simply forget the pain from our past, but we can't let it consume us. We can't let tragedy define us. The best we can do is use it as an opportunity to grow and move on. Because unfortunately, we can't always avoid tragedy. Zelda's last attempt to unlock her power at the Spring of Wisdom ends in failure, and mere moments later, Ganon returns. And in a matter of hours, Hyrule falls. The champions are trapped in their divine beasts, King Rome is trapped in Hyrule Castle, and all Link and Zelda could do is run. In the blink of an eye, everything falls apart. All of their preparations for this moment amounted to nothing, and Zelda the same strong soul who didn't shed a tear at her own mother's funeral, breaks down and cries, realizing that in spite of her hard work, she couldn't save them. She failed everyone. And now, it's looking like she won't be able to save Link either. As he makes his final stand, beaten and bruised, going beyond his limits all just to protect her, it's clear that Link won't survive this final attack. So, without thinking, Zelda steps in to protect him. There is still hope. Zelda asks for Link to be taken to the Shrine of Resurrection, and she places the Master Sword back on its pedestal so that the two could heal. However long that takes, in the meantime, she knows what must be done. The only thing that's been keeping her going all these years has been hope. Hope that Link will return and put an end to this nightmare. So who are we to let her down? Breath of the Wild was faced with the daunting task of moving the series forward when Zelda was at its lowest point. Expectations were through the roof, and the franchise's legacy must have been intimidating for the team as they developed the game. The end result is not only a masterclass in open-world game design that redefined the entire genre, it represents a fresh start for this legendary series and the company that took the risk to push the two into a new era. And I believe that's why this is the story Breath of the Wild decided to tell. A story about dealing with failure, about dealing with high expectations and the pressure of living up to the legacy and reputation of others, about learning to move on from tragedy to build a better tomorrow. We can always bounce back, because while Breath of the Wild broke many things, from long-standing conventions and traditions to my goddamn weapons, this game showed me that nothing is more durable than hope. Hope that brighter days are yet to come. The past few months have been the toughest of my life. During this time, nothing made sense. I didn't know what to do. I was lost, lonely, and everything seemed hopeless. And I was blaming myself for everything that was going wrong. 
I was angry at everything, angry and confused about why this was happening to me. More than anything, I was angry and disappointed at myself. It felt like everything I had worked for was all for nothing. I took some time to myself and took a break from working on this video during this period. When I returned to it, I still had a good chunk of the game left to record and a lot of the memories left to find. What I was going through allowed me to resonate with Breath of the Wild more than I ever had before. Its themes spoke to me in a way that I never could have imagined. Breath of the Wild helped to remind me that sometimes setbacks are unavoidable. Tragedy is unavoidable, and it can hit us when we least expect it. But no matter how hopeless things may seem, I can pull through. I can find a way to move on, to come out of any misfortune stronger than I was before. At the end of my Wind Waker review, I said that I still have a whole life ahead of me, new memories to make, new adventures to go on, new horizons to explore. I need to remember that more often, that everything I've done hasn't been for nothing, because there's still so much left in store for me, and I don't want to lose out on hope that things will get better. So no, I won't let myself be consumed. Life moves forward, and so will I. I'll set new goals for myself, I'll find new hobbies, I'll meet new people, I'll keep hanging on to the hope that I can be happy again. It feels like I'm closing an important chapter of my life. So much has changed in such a short amount of time. I've changed. Change can be frightening, and there will inevitably still be moments where I'll miss the way things used to be. But I'll embrace change and do my best to make the most out of it and craft a fresh start for myself. A new beginning.